So today I'd like to introduce a new chapter. Um, this is chapter 7, and in this chapter we'll cover linear momentum and its conservation. So to first define linear momentum, the linear momentum of an object is defined to be the product of the mass and the velocity. And for some reason, which I've never really figured out, we've always called momentum P in every textbook um, that I've ever seen. Because um, momentum is the mass times the velocity and velocity is a vector, then linear momentum is also a vector. And the direction of the uh, momentum will always point in the direction of the velocity because mass is a scalar that can never be negative. The dimensions of momentum are going to be the dimensions of mass times velocity, the dimension of mass is the kil a kilogram, and the dimensions of the velocity are meters per second. So the SI units of momentum are kilograms meters per second. Because momentum is a vector quantity, it can have components in the x, y, and z directions if so. We'll stick to two dimensions in this chapter, so we'll stick mainly with x and y. Now, N Newton originally defined his second law, which we defined in earlier chapters as force is equal to mass times acceleration. Newton originally defined the force as the rate, time rate of changes in momentum. So let me show you how that can be. We know from Newton's second law that the sum of the forces acting on the particle is equal to the mass times the acceleration. But let me show you what delta P over delta T can be. So if you look at a change in momentum, that would be the uh, final mass times velocity minus the initial mass times velocity. To stick with the notation in your book, that would be the velocity at some time T2 versus some time T1. So the change in the momentum would be mv2 minus mv1. And then if you divide that by the change in time, then you can see that you can factor out the mass, assuming the mass doesn't change, and pull that out front. And then you just have a change in velocity over a change in time. Well, we define the acceleration as a change in a velocity over a change in time. So following that logic, you can see that expressing the force as the time rate of change of the momentum is the same thing as saying F is equal to MA, assuming the mass is constant. And this is the form that Newton originally used to uh, express his second law. It's also a more general form, and it can allow for the change in mass of the system in addition to a change in the velocity. Okay, and so that's why Newton expressed it that way. I'd like to talk about now what happens during collisions because a lot of chapter, uh, this chapter on linear momentum is concerned with collisions. So um, you may have experienced this yourself, I hope not, but if you've ever been in a car wreck or let's say you've ever bumped into somebody else, then you felt that during collision with another body, you feel a force on your body, okay? Oftentimes, uh, during a collision, objects will be mushed and deformed during the collision because the forces are so large. Well, let's look at the way that Newton expressed his second law. The force is equal to the time rate of change of momentum, which is delta P over delta T. You can rearrange that equation and multiply both sides of that equation by delta T, and you'll, say, you'll see that the force times the change in time is equal to the change in momentum. So when you collide with something, your momentum will change. You can either go from traveling at some speed to going to nothing, where you sort of stick to the thing and you're not moving anymore, or you can bounce off, okay? But either way, your momentum has changed. That will define as an impulse. The change in the momentum, delta P, we'll call the impulse. And that impulse is equal to the force felt by the body during the collision time that change, times the change in time. Now, since the time of the collision is usually pretty short, even if the force isn't always constant over the time rate of change in the, um, the collision over that time, even if it's not always constant, we can pretend it is and get sort of an average force during that collision. So you can calculate from the change in the momentum the average force that the body experiences during that collision. The impulse will tell us that we can get the same change in momentum with a large force acting for a shorter time or a smaller force acting for a longer time. All right? So think about this for just a second. If you have two boxers and they're going at it in the ring, they make them wear gloves, right? The reason that they do that is because uh, it makes the force on the opponent that's receiving the punch 
a little less and does less damage to the body. The reason that it does that is because, let's say that you have a punch and you throw it and then you snap it back. Well, the momentum change that your fist has undergone is the same, regardless of whether you have, uh, ha are wearing a glove or not. But if the person is making contact with the face and you have this padding on the outside, that lengthens the time over which the collision occurs, right? Because the fist is here, but there's a lot of padding in front of it, and the padding gets mushed and then compressed back out, and that takes a longer time than if the fist just contacts the face and then pulls right back, because there's nothing to mush, so the collision time is shorter. So the reason that we have padding on our gloves, or the reason why we use airbags, or the reason that we bend our knees when we land, is because it lengthens the time of the collision, and that makes the average force lower for the same change in momentum, okay? So that's an interesting thing about impulse. Let me do an example problem for you using impulse and forces. Let's say that you have a 3 kilogram steel ball and it strikes a wall with a speed of 10 meters per second at an angle of 60 degrees to the wall. It bounces off with the same speed and angle. If the ball is in contact with the wall for 0.2 seconds, what's the average force exerted on that wall? Okay, well the first thing whenever you do any of these kinds of uh, problems in chapter 7, the first thing that you should always do is draw yourself a picture. So I've drawn that here in the slide. So here's my wall, it's that green rectangle, and then my ball is coming in at an angle of 60 degrees, and then I show not only the initial approach of the ball, but also the ball as it leaves at an angle also of 60 degrees with respect to the wall, okay? <clears throat> I'm going to define my uh, coordinate system here so that I center my coordinate system where the collision occurs with the wall and my plus x axis is pointing to the right and my plus y axis is pointing up like it does here. Now, whenever you do any kind of momentum problems in this chapter or impulse problems, you should write out what the initial and the final momenta are of your system. All right? Now, the wall's not going to move, so here I'm just concerned with the ball. The initial momentum of my ball is up and to the left. Okay, and I need to break that here into the components, the x and the y components. If you examine it, my initial x component is in the negative x direction. It's going left to begin with, so I put a minus sign out front. And the momentum is the mass times the velocity. And here we're worried about the x velocity. So my mass is 3 kilograms, and my x velocity is 10 meters per second. But now I just want that x component, okay? So this is making a triangle here with an angle of 60 degrees. If I want the x component, since the angle is with respect to the y axis, I use the sine function. So my initial momentum in the x direction is negative 3 kilograms times 10 meters per second times the sine of 60 degrees. Likewise, my initial momentum in the y, it's going upwards. That's the positive y direction. My mass is 3 kilograms. My speed is 10 meters per second, but I want the y component of the velocity. Since I use sine for the x direction, I'm going to use cosine for the y direction. So I've got plus 3 kilograms times 10 meters per second times the cosine of 60 degrees for my initial momentum in the y direction. Now, for my final momentum in the y and the x direction, it's yet again going to be 3 kilograms times 10 meters per second times the sine of 60, but now when it, after it collides, the ball is traveling to the right, okay? So that means that's in the plus x direction, so I have a different sign than I had initially. So it's plus 3 times 10 times sine of 60. Now the final momentum in the y direction, that really doesn't change. It was going up to begin with, and it's still going up, so it's still positive. And the y component um, is still going to use that cosine of 60. So I've got P final in the Y is equal to 3 kilograms times 10 meters per second times the cosine of 60, and that's positive. Okay, now that I've drawn my picture, picked my coordinate system, and wrote out the component forms of my initial and my final momentum, I can apply what I need to do for this problem, okay? Now, what we're going to do here is look at the change in the momentum. And the change in momentum I've defined to be my impulse, okay? Okay. 
So the impulse in the x direction is equal to delta p, the change in momentum in the x, which is p final in the x minus p initial in the x. So p final in the x is 3 times 10 times the sine of 60, and then I subtract off my initial, which is minus a negative 3 kilograms times 10 times sine of 60. If I do that, just multiplying and then adding those numbers together, I get 52 kilograms meters per second for my impulse, which I've denoted here as I, um, in the x direction, so I sub x. Now if I look at my impulse in the y direction, delta p y, then I get p final in y minus p initial in the y, and that's the impulse in the y direction. So here, 3 kilograms times 10 meters per second times cosine of 60, that's my final, minus my initial, which is 3 kilograms times 10 meters per second times cosine of 60, those are the same because my uh, momentum in the y direction doesn't change, so I have a net change of zero or an impulse of zero. Now, here, if you apply the uh, equation for Newton's second law, the time rate of change in the momentum is equal to the force, we can solve for the force that the ball feels during the collision. So F is equal to delta P over delta T. The force in the Y would just be zero because there's no change in momentum in the Y. But the change in the momentum in the X would be 52 kilograms meters per second divided by the time given for that collision, which was 0.2 seconds. And that gives me 260 newtons for a force felt in the x direction. Okay, so the impulse is the change in the momentum, and then the force is the impulse divided by the time. So we can figure out what the force experienced during a collision is using a slightly modified Newton's second law. Now, if you have two or more particles in a system and you don't have any external forces, then the total momentum of the system is going to remain constant because the sum of those external forces is zero. Now let me clarify. This is different from the example that we just did with the ball. There we just had one body that was com uh, colliding with a wall. Okay? The wall would be supplying that external force that I'm talking about. But if instead of a wall, we had, say, two billiard balls or something, and they collided with each other and bounced off, well, then if we made our system those two billiard balls, then there'd be nothing exerting an external force, you see? All the forces would be internal to the system. The internal forces would be the force of ball one on ball two and vice versa. But those are internal forces, okay? So if there's no external forces, then the uh, change, the sum of the forces for external is zero. And that means that momentum is conserved, all right? So I'm not talking about the momentum of an individual particle here. Of course, that will change. If I have a ball coming in from the left and the ball coming in from the right, and they collide with one another, right, then they're going to bounce off. The ball on the left and the ball on the right's momentum will change, but the sum for the system will be zero, okay? So what that means is that um, conservation of momentum can be expressed mathematically and can be used to solve for collision problems, for example. So what we would have is a total momentum of the system, which is constant, and you set the initial momentum of the system equal to the final momentum of the system, okay? And of course, you're going to have to do that in terms of the vector components, right? You have to take the x components, set initial equal to final, the y components you do separately, and set initial equal to final for the y components as well. And you can apply conservation momentum to any number of particles in the system. Of course, in this chapter, we'll probably only confine ourselves to two or three particles because it gets kind of tricky from there. Um, but uh, theoretically, it could be applied to any number of particles. Let me show you what I mean with an example problem, okay? Let's say that we have a man and a boy, and they're standing together on a smooth, icy surface. Let's neglect friction in this problem. The man is 70 kilograms, and the boy is half his mass for 35 kilograms. Now let's say that they want to do something fun. They're on ice skates, or they're on a really slippery surface, and so they put their hands together and they push each other apart. Okay? Well, they go apart like, the, like this. If you define the system of man and boy as an isolated system, then there's no external forces acting on the man and boy, assuming you neglect friction. So if they push each other apart and the man moves 0.3 meters per second relative to the ice, how far would they be after 5 seconds? Okay, 
So this system is going to employ conservation of momentum. The initial momentum in the system is going to be equal to the final because there's no external forces if you neglect friction. I've drawn myself a picture. That's one of the first things that you should always do. So here's my little stick man and here's my little stick boy. And this is their initial condition here on the left and they're both standing still. So neither of them has a velocity. They're both zero. Now, in the final condition, though, the man I'm going to have going to the left and the boy I'm going to have going to the right. I'm going to put my coordinate system where they uh, initially collided, where their hands touched and they pushed apart. Okay, so that's where I'm going to center my coordinate system. Now, I want to know how far apart they are. I'm going to call that distance after five seconds D, okay? And then what I'm trying to solve for is D. But in order to do that, I need to figure out what the final velocity of the boy is, right? Because I need to know how fast he's going so I can know how far he traveled in five seconds in order to figure this problem out. So that's kind of a list of my knowns and my unknowns. Now the deal is momentum's conserved because there's no external forces. Since they both start out at rest, their initial momentum is zero. Okay, that's the initial momentum for the system. I'm going to define the system as man and boy. Since momentum's conserved, my initial momentum equals to my final momentum, and that equals to zero, because I know what the initial momentum of my system is, and it's zero. So the man and the boy, they make up the system, their final momentum must sum to zero. So zero is equal to P final, which is equal to P initial. And now I'm going to choose the coordinate system here. I'm only moving in the X, okay, I'm confined to one dimension. So 70 kilograms then, the man is moving in the negative X direction, which is minus 0.3 meters per second, okay. And then the boy, I don't know his final velocity. So that's plus 35 kilograms, which is his mass, times V final of the boy, which is what I'm solving for. Now, since I have this equal to zero, I can take the um, momentum for the man, the final momentum for the man, and move it to the left-hand side. So I add 70 kilograms times 0.3 meters per second to both sides, and that cancels it out on the right-hand side. So I have 70 kilograms times 0.3 meters per second equals to 35 kilograms times the final velocity of the boy. And now I can solve that out. Dividing both sides by 35, I can find the final velocity of the boy is 0.6 meters per second. Okay, but I'm not quite done yet, right? Because what the problem asked for was the total distance between the man and the boy after five seconds. So what we have to do is sum up the distance that the man covers in five seconds with the distance the boy travels in five seconds to get the total distance between those two people, which I call D. Now here, if we neglect friction, their velocities are going to be constant after they push off. So D is equal to the velocity times the time. So the distance that the man covers is going to be 0.3 meters per second times five seconds, and that gives me 1.5 meters. And the distance that the boy covers is 0.6 meters per second times 5 seconds, and that gives me 3 meters. So to find the total distance, I sum those two numbers, and I get 4.5 meters for the total distance traveled in 5 seconds, and I've solved my problem. All right? So to sum up with what we've covered today, the momentum is a new quantity that we define that equals the mass times the velocity. If you have a collision, then the body will experience a force during the collision. We use the concept of impulse to define that. The impulse is the change in the momentum, okay? And the force is equal to the impulse divided by the time. And that's the average force experienced by the body. And you can use that to solve for forces during collisions. And then finally, if there's no external forces, then the momentum of the system is conserved, and you can use that to solve problems where you have collisions. And we're going to do more of that in the next lecture. So I'll see you in class.